I wish you focused more. I just wish you would focus more and you could reach that potential. These are common phrases that are used in a variety of different settings. Education, business, sport. It's also an insight into my school years. Lee, I wish you would just focus more and then you could actually do something with your life. I'm here to discuss that this is probably not the truth. I'm here to discuss the fact that it's not necessarily we need more focus. We need to know what to focus on. Because seeing is not always seeing. Now let's do a little activity. I'd like you to close your eyes, please. What do you see? Now I realize I've just asked you to close your eyes. But in your mind, what do you see? To your left, five yards to your right, in front of you, behind you. Are you surprised by some of the details that you know and don't know about your surroundings? Have you made anything up? Now open your eyes and see if you are correct. Now, this simple little activity gives us a lot of information about how you use your eyes and how you pick up information in the situation that you are in. It tells us about your ability to filter. It tells us about your use of memory. It also tells us about your ability to pay attention and your search strategies. All key components in decision-making in dynamic environments. Now, before I move forward, I need to highlight where I'm coming from, from, from a decision-making perspective. It's the most important cognitive process that we go through. It entails a selection of an, of, from, a, from, a different, uh, from different things. It allows us to see the environment it gives us the opportunity to demonstrate our abilities. We try to make decisions to influence outcomes. We try to use our decisions to influence the situations that we are in. We can use them to demonstrate our development. How do we make decisions, though? This is something we're going, to, we're going to discuss. Some decisions are made reflectively and over time. Think about what you've done today. What you had for breakfast, for example. Or if you were, the clothes that you wore today. Or where you sat in the auditorium today. Some are made instinctively or quickly. And these are typically decisions that are made in short spaces of time under pressure, and these are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on. So, for example, one of my friends, he went to a safari park, uh, one of those drive through ones with his family, his wife and, and two children, um, and this happened. <laughs> um, he openly says that he had a variety of different decisions that was going through his head, but ultimately what he decided to do was very, very calmly push the camel's head out of the car, all the while, his daughter is asking him, can we keep it? <laughs> so, in a variety of different settings, in sport, in rugby, in basketball, in ice hockey, where decisions are having to be made incredibly quickly, so much is going on, there's a lot to think about. In the world of soccer, there are officials that are having to make upwards of four and five decisions every minute. If you start to accumulate that, you can start to realize how much of a hard job an official has. Within rugby, it's becoming acknowledged that the physical demands are becoming ever more apparent, and physical programs are, uh, are, are matching this. But there are elements to say that actually, it's not necessarily the physical elements 
that are the main determinants. It's game intelligence. It's decision making. And with decision making being highlighted as something important, especially within these settings, especially within dynamic settings, it's imperative we know the processes that people go through in order to make them. So how do we make decisions? In order to make a decision, we need information from the environment that we are in at the present and also memory. Upwards of 90%, according to whichever situation you're in, the information comes through our eyes. And this has been documented a number of times, varying in the percentage, once again, depending on the situation. So it's quite surprising when you start to ask athletes, coaches, people in dynamic situations, how much focus do you place on the eyes when trying to improve decision making? Not many of them say that they do. Yet, constantly, athletes, those in dynamic situations, are saying that they wish they'd make smarter decisions. Or they were more consistent in their decision making processes. How can you be more consistent and make smarter decisions if you're missing a vital part of the puzzle, which is the eyes. So this is something we're going to explore. So these are eye trackers, okay? So these are something that have, they're not just glasses, they're not just something that have, uh, I've <laughs> randomly wear into it for, for good health. They give us the opportunity to see exactly where people are looking at a given point. It gives us the opportunity to outline what people go through, the processes people go through, in order to pick up information. Because there is this disconnect at this present moment in time between acknowledging the fact that the eyes are important and actually what is going on with the training and what's going on in the background. So there is this paradox with what could be termed a sports vision training. We need to acknowledge the fact that eyesight and vision are distinctly different, despite the fact that they are used sometimes quite interchangeably. There is something that needs to be taken into account, that eyesight is actually the clarity in which things are seen. We all have eye tests, or at least we should, we should go for them for one, uh, once a year. But this is something that we have experience with. We, we look at a chart, we look at a bunch of letters and see how far down that chart we can get to. We come out with a score, 2020, wicked, happy days. And we think everything is fine with regards to our, uh, our, our eyesight. And we don't need to do anything more. But actually, 2020 is just an average score. And it only tells us half the story, because eyesight is just the clarity. The vision is what we see. Okay? The vision is our interpretation of what we see. Now, you can see from the video now, there's a little cursor moving around. So don't be worried that you're now seeing yourself on the, on the screen. But this is exactly what I'm looking at at a given point. It assesses our gaze behavior or search patterns, whichever way that you want to, you, whichever way you want to phrase it. It tells us what people are looking at, in what order, how long for, and it gives us vital information in certain situations. Now you can see I'm just wearing these glasses quite happily now. Um, and walking around, I could go and play a rugby game if I, if I wanted to, as long as they're strapped in and uh, I was allowed to, because they do cost. <laughs> um, but there is something to consider with this. They haven't always, they've been on a journey, they haven't always been this mobile. The first system actually made contact with the eyeball itself, and the, the eyeball was moving around, and the piece of equipment then moved with the eyeball. 
That was 100 years ago, thankfully. So I can imagine that would have been very, very uncomfortable. My first experience with eye tracking technology um, was that you had to wear the, eye, uh, wear the eye tracker. It really, really closed off your periphery vision. You then had to connect that to a laptop. You then had to wear, put that into a backpack, which then you had to wear. So then you were running around looking a little bit like a Ghostbuster. So this is something that the technology has now developed. It's got to the point where we're able to use it in quite a lot of applied settings. Originally, a lot of the research had been done in labs. It had been done in settings that use screens, for example. Now, it gave us some valuable information. It gave us some in, in, real good insights into what people look at in certain situations. But this is something that we can now go further. We can develop even more. It can tell us exactly what a cricketer is looking at when facing a ball, because we can wear it at that given point. We can look at what a firefighter is going through when they're going into an emergency situation. Surgeons, what do they look at at certain points? A soldier clearing a room, what do they look at? Because there is some common practices where cameras are placed on helmets, and that tells us the direction in which people are looking, which gives us some interesting information. But because there's a lot of space in front of us, we don't know exactly what they're looking at. So we can see the process that people are going through. Now, as you can see, we can do it live. So this has a range of about 60 meters, so it can, we can quite happily put it on a halfway line of a, of a rugby pitch, and they can go off and, and, and do their thing. And we can give live coaching as it, as it goes through, give them focus points, change their focus at certain points. But we can also have retrospective discussions and reflections with our athletes, with people in dynamic situations. Because the eye tracker, it tells us what people are looking at. It doesn't tell us the why. So that is the important question. Why are you looking at certain things? Because there are quite generic coaching points at points where people say, focus on the ball. The ball is the most important thing. Only focus on the ball. Where actually, for some people, that may not be the case. Focus on the belly button. The belly button is what's going to tell you when the person is going to change direction. I'm no expert in anatomy and physiology, but pretty sure the belly button's not going to determine changing of direction. So why tell someone to focus on it? There is also this concept of you need to scan your area more to know your environment, which in itself is a, is a decent coaching point. However, it's not very specific, because what that has led to is a lot of people just randomly shaking their head like so, and all that does is make them dizzy, give them headaches, but they think that they are scanning their areas. And in this as well, it's really important to note that when you move your eyes, you're not actually taking in information. You only take in information when you stop and pause and look at what you are paying attention to. Even if that's for 0.1, 0.2 of a second, even quicker than that. It's not during movement that you take in information. Now, you don't need an eye tracker to tell you that, and that can just be a simple coaching point for this. Okay? But with this, it's really important that we take into consideration, in order to make decisions, we need information. More importantly, we need the right information. We need to be able to filter into relevant and irrelevant, and we need to know what to focus on from an individual perspective, because not everyone is the same. Eye tracking technology has the ability to be able to show us what people do in a variety of, set, in a variety of settings. And it gives us the opportunity to help them develop their decision-making processes. And it could be the key part of the puzzle when focusing on the eyes and picking up information. So I ask you again, if you close your eyes, what do you see? Thank you for listening.